So good afternoon, everybody. We are uh, right in time to start. Uh, everybody is in the room. And we are going to have uh, some time together. We're, we have one hour to redefine the future of, uh, of uh, Transcade Aorti valve replacement. And I'm here together with uh, my spokesperson, Dr. Pilar Jimenez Quevedo from Spain. We have two big experts, one interventional cardiologist, uh, one uh, uh, surgeon, and sometimes uh, also opposite, uh, uh, Jörg Kempfert, uh, and uh, somebody who has a future, I think is a rising, rising star, Martin Leon, I, I know him, <laughs> I think in the future so there is some opportunity. We have a great chat master, so if you want to interact, you can interact both uh, sp speaking with us or by our app, uh, which is uh, Dr. Van Belli from Netherlands. We have Iris, Iris, sorry, Iris. Iris is Italian. Iris, <coughs> welcome. He was uh, going to make some drawings, so if you say something funny, she will probably make a drawing. So if you think about it. So interact with us, you get, uh, you get the, uh, the picture. And we have a number of speakers I will introduce time by time, by time but uh, from, uh, from different uh, sites. And again, uh, this is meant to be a kind of a brainstorming session, something like they call it jamboree. I learned today from, uh, from, uh, <coughs> from Bernard Prendergast. Uh, who knows what is jamboree? Something like that, something what happens today. I don't know what that means, but it's a nice name. So, <laughs> okay, so let's start with, uh, with the interview to the, to the experts and the topic and the objective is, what is the ideal platform for the future? That platform for uh, aortic valve replacement that is going to become the best option for the largest majority of our patients. And uh, feel free to give us also directions. So, Pilar, is your time. I will stay here, I will take notes. I will be like uh, taking notes. You already say the question. So, <laughs> let's start with the implant phase and then with lifetime, uh, lifetime management. So, what do you think is going to be one of the features uh, for the future uh, TAVI platform? So what was the name again? Jamborino? Jam okay, I still don't know what this is, but I can remember when I was a kid, there was the Christmas wish list. So let's assume I had a wish for Christmas for a new Tavi valve. I would like to have something that is not going to use any PVL. Coming from the surgical side, for me, this is still a major one. Okay. No PVL, so you don't like PVL. Good. No, uh, surgeons hate PVL. I learned this a long time ago. So, so we started thinking about transcatheter valves when I worked with uh, um, Alain Cribier about 25 years ago. We had an aspirational wish list. And I'll tell you, 25 years later, we still haven't gotten there yet. So to me, there is no perfect valve yet. But we had a good list of things that we liked. What I learned, however, was the initial list changed over time. Uh, and one of the things that became, to me, very important was what we call ease of use or generalizability so that the system can be used by physicians who have varying skill sets with good results. And to me, that's one of the most important properties of a successful TAVI system and why it's grown so much. But I would add, because I agree with Jorg, that the two things I would not compromise is PVL, I don't know if we can completely eliminate it, but it cannot be above mild, and I would argue that the mild number needs to come closer to trace, um, uh, and AV conduction. I think you need to have single digit um, uh, a pacemakers. Those are some of the initial fundamental features, and I'm sure we'll talk about some others too. I mean, these are typical bullet points that we had on the old wish list that are still yep. relevant. And we have also discovered, I guess, some new ones that from a surgical perspective for me wasn't so important at first glance, which is coronary access. This is, I think, something that in the first phase of TAVI, it wasn't such a huge issue, uh, not only for coronary access in case of uh, urgent PCI, this is a very obvious one, but most importantly now that we are going to the younger patient cohort, we also durability hopefully is good. We all know that a significant portion of these patients will get 
have to get a second valve. And this is why then, this is a, I don't know how we call this, this is not direct coronary access itself, but it's more revalvability or something like that, if this is our expression. You can invent one, Francesco. You know, it's funny, in the beginning, we, we used to use this phrase, commissural alignment. We didn't even quite know what it was, to be honest, and it was pretty much irrelevant in the early days, where all you could do is treat these high-risk patients and hopefully get out of the lab safely with a reasonable result. Now, suddenly, everybody is obsessed with coronary access and commissural alignment. So I think there's something to this, and I think it's an important feature of a modern TAVI. If you want to be competitive, you want to have access to the coronaries. You're treating people younger, they're going to have STEMIs, they're going to have diffuse coronary disease. You must have relatively um, unimpeded access to the coronary. So that's another feature that I think is pretty important. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because, you know, I think uh, the very first uh, Object, you know, the, the objection from the surgical community, even from me. I mean, which I, I've been one of the first believing, but I thought the coronary access, was, coronary obstruction, would be the problem. Okay, you remember that at the very, very beginning, and, and Cribier convinced us with that single picture showing us that the coronary level was above the lifts. But now he's coming back, and it, it's a, it's a matter of uh, uh, coronary access, but also you, you mentioned. Uh, the possibility to do multiple valve valves. I mean, when you, we think about a, a lifetime management, uh, probably also, I don't know how to call it. My name is, re, I like revalvability. Anyone has a different name for? Treat? Treat? Retreatability. No, treatability is one, one time. Multiple treatability. Find a, a name for your uh, uh, <laughs> next database. <laughs> Uh, let's call it Vivid, vivid 2, vivid, yeah. <laughs> uh, re redoability. So what did you put there, coronary access or how did you name it? I think coronary access is one point, even for the first implant. This is the a problem is stuff, what huh? you do, when you do two, three times, four times, I mean... Revalvability. Revalvability? Revalvability? You like revivability? revivability. <laughs> Who likes yeah, yeah, but that's many things. It's, like, it's, it's going like, to be it's in the writ written in the, in, in, in the textbook afterwards. And then don't complain. Eh? <laughs> I'm, I'm writing the textbook now. Eh? Revalvability. Re re valve. But this is something that is ability. The, this is the end effect, right? But I mean, the most specific parts is, I guess, if we break that down to acute coronary access, we know what this is. But it's more the combination of the low neoskirt and the option to go for anatomic alignment. And these, these two factors are going to uh, impact the revalvability, which is going to be in the textbook. Yeah, but I also think what will impact it is the uh, hemodynamics. Um, so, I mean, you can have coronary access, but unless you achieve good enough hemodynamics where you can safely put another valve in with expected reasonable durability, then you've lost it. So, hemodynamics now has been, has been certainly raised as an important feature. Uh, you know, and there are a lot of reasons why that's so. I'm, I'm not sure, uh, you know, and you can argue between, um, you know, echoes or doing invasive gradients. I, I don't really care so much, but, but the issue of getting consistent good hemodynamics, I think, is important in terms of you know, the long-term sustainability of the platform. So hemodynamics is, a, is obviously, it's, so you are unhappy with the current hemodynamics, or what, what is the, the background? Uh, for that? valve and valve, I'm not happy, no. Okay. I, mean, I, I mean, why are we cracking valves? I mean, um, uh, I, you know, I think that in small annuluses for some systems and for valve and valve, I think the hemodynamics are acceptable, but barely. And they, and they should be better. So we touched about the new textbook term, revalvability. So the question is, why would you want to revalve only if the durability is over? Let's put it that way. Um, so durability definitely is an acute or midterm thing that is important. I know it's hard to assess. We don't have the data yet. But on the wish list, it's Christmas time. So let's put it, huh? Marlene, is there any question from the from the chat? Nobody wants to have more than that. No, not yet. Pr no. Low price. Is, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking yes, about low free. price. <laughs> uh, so durability, dura mater, dura. 
you see, the risk here is that you don't know how to write it in English, and everybody sees that you are an idiot. <laughs> so, so I hope it's okay. Good. So, oh, so let me ask you. Um, you know, we talk about the location of the valve, um, intraannular, periannular, superannular. Uh, is that a characteristic that, that you would want or not want? Do you care? Well, you know, uh, if I think about my current practice, uh, I like to have intra superannual depending on the situation, obviously. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, it's not bad to have a superannual design in patients uh, where I need to uh, go for bulb in bulb. Uh, on the other hand, having an intraannual obviously has a more long-term perspective of uh, access to coronaries and re revolvability and so on. <laughs> so uh, th this is the, I mean, uh, to go back to your first uh, statement, I think uh, there is not an ideal prosthesis. I, I think the only ideal valve has been made by uh, the guy upstairs. Uh, and unfortunately, he didn't give us uh, the recipe. Uh, but we need to find the right compromise. And, and the question would be even whether one valve fits all or we need to have uh, multiple solutions for, to tackle the, the, the different things. And uh, well, we are collecting many different things. Is there anyone who wants to suggest? I tell you some secrets, guys. You need to know. In the back, we have not only the Abbott engineers, but there are also other companies engineers. <laughs> they are taking notes. So you can ask. Ask now. Whatever you want. For instance, I'd ah, OK. We have, what do you want? Uh, low profile low for bleeding and vascular complications. So, so how small. Small would you like? This is very important. Is, is 18 good enough, 16, 14, what would you like? Well, uh, if it is... You want, tra you want transradial? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody saying right but being a little bit more realistic. Well, maybe, what would you like? Uh, 8 French, 10 French. Interesting. There is a, maybe 10 French. Is there, is a system being there is a system being developed that is 10 French. But I think it's not easily achievable in the current valve designs to get down that low. And, um, but that's an interesting point. I, I would argue there are a lot of complex anatomies. And the one that, if you talk about a valve for life, you, can't, you have to talk about bicuspids. So you've got to have a system that really is going to be effective in bicuspids, that have a lot of eccentric and bulky calcium that extends up into the leaflets. And you also have to deal with situations like extreme horizontal aortas, you know, unusual anatomies. So the system has to be very deliverable. Now that's part of ease of use, but that also is another characteristic. So when we talk about versatility, it, it starts to be a bit a complicated uh, 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 wish list. There is a one wish which is a bit, uh, you know. I thought you would draw a funny picture, though. Uh, she's <laughs> doing that. <laughs> She's okay. making fun of me, first of all. She made me too fat. Look at me. <laughs> she made you too young. <laughs> and York before having the, the, new, the new look. You don't have this anymore. No. You need to update. I think uh, till now, the only one who's getting pretty good is uh, uh, Pilar. I like you. There I you like go. you very much. But, Thank you very much. But you don't have the glasses today. She's much more beautiful without glasses. Take the glasses out, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I agree with you. Uh, <clears throat> better stop here. Okay? Better stop here. You want the bad with complications. Otherwise, we don't have ICI complications. We want complications, correct? Yeah, please, make bads with complications. Otherwise, we cannot do the complication meeting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no other wishes here? It looks like There's we... There's one, one suggestion from the audience that um, we need a valve that can also treat AR. AR, wow. Why we forgot AR? So, vers should be versatility or something, another category? That is an important point. That's Would an interesting question, right? Whether or not do you want to really wish one device that can... Uh, cater for all needs, or is it 
more realistic or does it more have more sense to break it down to different engineering concepts? This is, I guess, the question. If you want to have one size, one valve fits all needs, or do you want to prefer have a selection of devices <coughs> that are specifically designed for one or the other aspect of these wish list? It's a good point. I, I, I forgot when you were talking about the prof low profile, I remember, I don't know if you remember, Marty, at the Mitel valve meeting, we developed, we made a kind of uh, you know, exercise of being very provocative, and we managed to, to make a startup developing a, a, a valve with wireless implantation that you just uh, build it inside the body. That would be nice. Something like you just some microbots that come in in the in the vein of <laughs> huh? nice huh? can be I, done I think that if you but if you try to do everything in one device, then you start making too many compromises so I, I you know I really think the design is is different enough for AR that I would probably put that aside because uh, I just think it's a different application but so I, I think it's a very good point. Uh, probably we have been doing a little bit too much of trying to fit our devices in our patients and not the opposite. I think it makes a lot of sense. You know, what I would suggest now, we have some beautiful cases to uh, support our discussion and see where we stand. You know, compare, you know, obviously this is a sponsor session. We will see some... Uh, uh, off-label indications, so I will be. I will take full responsibility. So don't worry about <laughs> some uh, more than two leaflets, uh, I, I, less than three leaflets, things like that. But we will check these uh, cases, and we, we we can, if you want, interact and say, okay, I'm convinced that we achieved. Uh, I don't know, hemodynamics, whatever, <laughs> with these cases. So the first case is from uh, Tiffany Patterson, who shows us a case which is called uh, Tavi through a tunnel. <laughs> and I take responsibility as well of the titles. We have been uh, trying to make the funny titles. I don't know if it is a funny case. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so my name is Tiffany Patterson. I'm from St. Thomas's in London. I'm going to show you a case. Um, Wait a second, because we don't have the case now showed there. Maybe we need uh, some help from... Okay, thank you. Fantastic. So we're relatively new adopters of the uh, platform, the FlexNav Navator device, um, but actually it's come in very handy uh, and we've noticed there's been a lot of gaps in our practice that have been filled by the specific device, so it's been very useful. So this is a case of an 88-year-old gentleman with low-flow, low-gradient, severe aortic stenosis who'd been under surveillance for a while, but actually started developing progressive symptoms and was NYHA class 3. So it's one of our sort of typical high-risk patients. The patient had lung disease, emphysema, um, history of asbestos explo exposure and pleural parks, um, reduced FEV1, reduced transfer capacity. So, as is often the case, uh, coexisting um, vascular disease uh, with a, a previous uh, EVAR performed in 2019 for bilateral common iliac aneurysm. So, it's actually an EVAR with bilateral iliac extension and also a right sided internal branch device, which just meant they stented into the internal iliac. So, it was discussed at the heart team. Um, uh, initially uh, when I wasn't there, and they felt that this was probably a, a non-TF TAVI. So for consideration of transapical TAVI procedure um, and also to review the images to consider subclavian access. So if I just, this is just playing through. You see it's playing a little bit quickly, but we've got the um, EVAR there and extensive stenting. And, and this would conventionally, and certainly historically, uh, have been prohibitive for transfemoral access. So we considered all the options. How recent was, was the stents in the EVAR? Say that again, sorry. How recently were they placed? 2019, so, okay, so four years. what, four years, yeah, three, four years ago. So here's a zoom in, um, vessel reconstruction, just done on a simple pack server, not done anything clever here. But just on the left-hand side, you can see 
uh, the left-hand panel, you can see the extensive stenting that extends into the um, external iliacs, uh, very close to the common femorals. The common femorals are uh, severely diseased. So there's lots of prohibitive factors here about this patient. And the vessel size goes down to 5.5 millimetres, but not your conventional 5.5. This is 5.5 with stents. The left side was worse. Um, the right side was preferable on balance. So I had a chat with our vascular surgeons. So the annulus, uh, looking at the aortic valve annulus just very quickly, this was certainly going to be for us in our centre a self-expanding device. There was heavy STJ uh, calcification. The annulus size was um, reasonable, not neither extreme. 415 sinuses were slightly on the larger side. On balance, decided to go with a 27 Navator. Uh, and, and the reasoning behind this was the deliverability. We found that increasingly, although we'd not done an, I'd not done an EVAR before, uh, an iliac stenting with this device, I'd found actually the deliverability was so smooth uh, and easily done that we thought it'd be reasonable to try this and um, just have our vascular surgeons on board. And if we needed bailout, we needed bailout. And there was two issues. It was the CFA that was heavily calcified and diseased, but also the, ex the extensive stenting. So this is just for contralateral access. I'm showing you the images that I took at the time. So uh, we start all cases with um, micropuncture, uh, bilateral access because it was a self-expanding device. And you can see there's, there's a lot of stent um, to negotiate. And on the right-hand side, I've just done a quick picture to show you um, what actually is happening here. So you've got the EVAR, then extending bilaterally into the iliacs, and then you've got another branch there. So I then jump to the valve procedure, and the valve itself was, very, was uncomplicated. This was a nice, straightforward procedure. And, and what's nice for us is that having not uh, been a high-volume um, uh, portico centre, uh, we, when we moved to Navitor, actually, it was so easy to use that we were able to adopt it very quickly. So we've adopted it for subclavian and, uh, and transfemoral access, and valve delivery we find very straightforward. <coughs> So this is now the device coming out. So the reason I'm showing the device coming out is because uh, some systems are reportedly 14 French, but this is actually, but they actually expand as they come out. And, and these stents tend to move. So uh, the reason I was screening it out, and I screened it up, but that wasn't saved. The reason I was screening it out is because uh, often these stents can move um, when there's friction, and often there could be friction after valve delivery. But these didn't move at all. They stayed intact. And, you know, there's also a risk of endo leak, hence the aortogram. But all of this was fine under the very close watchful eye of our vascular surgeons. So you can see this final check shot. There's a small leak. Um, when I'm worried about vascular access, I often put uh, a tight in the proglide over an eight French sheath, take a picture and see, see where I'm at. And I can see here there's a small leak. So I close with an angio seal. And just to be absolutely sure, so we didn't have to go back in, I punctured just ben beneath um, with a micropuncture kit and did a check shot and everything looked fine. So actually, we got away with not doing subclavian or transapical, avoided general anaesthetic here. And, and for me, that's, that's pretty dramatic. You're an 88-year-old patient um, who otherwise would have uh, had to undergo a really um, heavy-going procedure and then have remained in hospital afterwards. So actually, this was a great solution for us. Thank you, Tiffany. <laughs> so, so, so. When you present this case, you want to convince us on which one of these uh, features here? Maybe low profile or ease of use? Yeah, well, I, I think that uh, there's a lot. I think every case, uh, you know. Deliverability, maybe? Yeah, deliverability. So just for this specific case, um, it was deliverable. Is one of the typical advantage, I think, of this plat specifically of this platform. Is but but every very well. every TAVI you do, you want it to meet all of these criteria. You know, you want you're thinking ahead, aren't you? You're thinking about are they going to get a redo TAVI? Oh, this guy was 88, maybe not. But you know, you want all of these benefits. I think uh, you know. I don't know who has the experience of uh, TAVI in a patient with the previous ever. I have also very bad experience. Who has a bad experience? I have. 
know, the, the vascular surgery had been uh, almost killing me afterwards because I, you know, because what happens is, you know, if you treat the, and the question from Martin Leon was very important, how old is the procedure? Because if you treat right after the never, uh, the branches may be very movable. Ah. <coughs> I think uh, this, uh, this case shows the flexibility of the platform. So uh, I think we, uh, we, you can put something on easy to use. The ease of use is, uh, yeah. I really think that. I would like to make a question. Do you change the secondary access to the radial? You always uh, use the femoral? Um, I know, so, so from, from my perspective, uh, it's, if we need to cross over and do any sort of bailout strategies, it'd be very difficult here with the EVA. It'd be a probably be a surgical bailout, if anything, from the vascular team. But generally, I do use femoral. I know people can get um, large enough um, sheaths through the radial, but for me, it's a case of knowing my the length of my vascular bailout kit and being able to cross over and doing something I'm familiar with. So if I needed to do a bailout procedure on the on that side, I'd get contralateral access. It's just what I'm more familiar with in terms of stenting the vessel. Obviously, in, a, in a ever, I think it's almost impossible to do crossovers. <laughs> no, it'll be, it'll be surgical almost bailout. Impossible. Yeah, it's not impossible. Nothing is impossible. In that. Yeah, in this case with iliac limbs, I think it would be, you know, essentially impossible to do a crossover. Almost. Yeah. Well, I mean, never you, could, say never. you could always try anything, but so in this case, I'd be prepared actually to have secondary access from a radial with, you know, long wires and long, you know, long equipment. Have it ready. Um, we would probably, because these can be so tricky, um, but you know, each center is different. But we've got some people who are really strong endovascular people, and we would, you know, involve our endovascular specialist to, you know, discuss what the strategy would be in terms of equipment and what the bailout would be if we had a complication. Yeah, and don't forget, though, that, you know, it's quite a long way from the arm, and yep. an 88-year-old would have a lot of tortuosity of the vessels. It, so, it could be, yes. So it's I, worth considering I mean, that as well. No, you're right. I mean, it may not be the best approach, and you do need longer wires, and you need, I mean, you have to be prepared if you're going to go, you know, radial to be able to bail out. Um, um, uh, um, a, an uh, ephemeral access side, so so you've got to be ready. I think uh, very important just to inform your vascular surgeons at least yeah. uh, you know up front because I did it afterwards. It was a disaster. So <laughs> listen, I have a little problem on your page. You remember this page? Mm -hmm. the, the but also <laughs> what we have to mention here, you used a nice trick of the micropuncture on the, the uh, on the large access side, which is uh, I guess underused sometimes because it gives you the extra option to have. Uh, uh, access and just for visualization, but also if you need to do stenting, also this you can access go, can you can be go used. Under. So. Yeah, we've had that. Few. Well, um, we've been bailed out a lot by our vascular surgeons, so we've learned a lot of their techniques. So we picked <laughs> them up along the along the way. So, well, thank you, Tiffany, for this case. I think uh, good case. You know, when when uh, so this this is an example of of a. Of a Let's say compromise this the platform, the Navitor platform, has a, is a very little metal, so very flexible, very deliverable. You compromise maybe a little bit the radial force, so it's always a compromise, but that shows that versatility. What about the next case? We have a new case uh, from Danny Dvir, who is going to speak not about uh, Vadim Vav, not about Basilica. It's a, it's a premiere. It's a premiere. <laughs> so you know something else out of that? Yeah, I hope. Amazing. <laughs> the most horizontal aorta you ever seen. I have ever. Maybe you see. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to present here. So many good friends here that I see. Uh, we'll go uh, forward. It's an 84-year-old lady with a severe AS, a severe symptomatic, nothing unique, except for extreme kyphoscoliosis. This is her aorta, which is a tortuous, very tortuous. We'll focus on some of these uh, uh, parameters here. There are several tortuosity patterns here, both the distally and proximally. 
This is the injection through the leg. She is considered for Tavi. This is the left side. Really like a roller coaster. And this is the aorta. This is the aortic root in three cusp view. LAO 42, caudal 27. Very abnormal angle, right? So it got like a 92 angle, uh, Francesco. It's nice. It's really flat. Yeah. <laughs> it's fun. I like it. It's interesting what nature created, right? Flat. And this is the uh, right-left cusp overlap view, which is usually in RAO caudal. Here it's in LAO 34, caudal 48. And uh, this is the delivery of the large sheath through the leg. You understand that there are many levels of tortuosity in this case. And by the way, we use the left leg for the a secondary arterial uh, uh, access, but maybe maybe the radial was a good approach here, but I didn't. And this is the traversal of the aortic valve. Nothing unique, needed a long uh, catheter, long AL, but nothing dramatic. I was so confused about how the uh, relationship between the aortic valve and the LV looked like that I wanted to inject in the LV to understand where, where actually I need to position the, the stiff wire in the LV. Actually, the LV in RAO30 looks normal, but look where the aortic valve pictel, like uh, the aortic valve, the annulus, in relationship to the LV. It's uh, so abnormal, right? Balloon valvuloplasty as usual over a Landerquist wire. And obviously, this is going as for ease of use for the Navitor platform that for sure, to me, it, this is the right device for that anatomy. Delivery through that crazy abdominal aorta, not a problem. Delivery through that hairpin uh, aortic arch, not a problem at all. Delivering through the aortic valve, also not a problem. And here we do <laughs> regular TAVI. It was not uh, actually no need for reposition, no uh, challenge in the case. This is how it looks in AP, by the way. That's the final step of the implantation. So I think that in order to understand ease of use, we need to go to extreme situations in order to understand that the system is really uh, easy. This is the post-implantation aortogram. Uh, she got the title of trivia leak, but actually, both here and in echo, I receive uh, almost nothing at all. No? So I'm nothing unique to tell about that uh, case. The legs looked okay. This is the echo afterwards. Uh, I don't see a lot of leakage, but uh, she got trivial PVL. Gradients are good, and she was discharged quickly after. And I think that this case is really presents the feasibility of performing a safe Navito in a very challenging anatomy. Thank you so much. I have a question, Danny, about the why. I've seen that you have been obvious, almost doing a wireless procedure. Is it your common practice to pull the wire out, or it was because of this? Uh, I think that with the push through the aortic valve, the wire was pulled a bit. Uh, I imagine, I don't really recall the steps, but it was not my practice because also in the beginning of the procedure, the wire was a bit pulled out. At the end of the procedure, obviously, we all pull out the wire a bit. Uh, but here, I imagine that while I was pushing, it pulled, was pulled out. I mean, this is a really good case. Um, uh, you were saved. The tortuosity was extreme, but there wasn't very much calcification, and that really made a big difference, um, both in the iliofemorals and in the aorta and in the arch. So when you push the device, it tended to straighten a little bit, which really helped a lot. Another trick that a lot of people use is they take the contralateral pigtail and they put a Lunderquist in it so you have two stiff wires. And that straightens it much more and makes it even easier. But it's impressive how deliverable um, this device is and that kind of extreme anatomy. I, I mean, maybe you can get a short frame device to do that, but I, there aren't too many long frame devices that I think would have gone so easily.
So then, do you ever use a, a sheath to to bridge or to bypass, so to say, the first level of tortuosity in the LEX? If uh, while going it felt abnormal, then I would obviously take it out and uh, put a sheath, and then use a body wire from the other leg or something like that. That would have been maybe the advantage of using another uh, femoral axis, and not radial in this case. Um, but as you saw, sheathless, it's going through as a snake through very crazy anatomies and no issues. Okay, so we have many other cases. Thank you so much. This was a great uh, presentation. The, ne the next case is, uh, what is, is, a, is a short cut. It's a provo provocation. Not an invocation, but a provocation. Propagation. Propaganda. Here we go. Okay, so uh, the first cut is the deepest, the influence of hemodynamics on structural deterioration and survival. So what does this mean? You do not get a second chance to perform your first procedure. Your first cut is the deepest. So whether it's SAB or TABR, just think about that. We need to give our patients the best chance for a long-term solution to aortic stenosis. And all second procedures carry challenges and consequences, all not as good as the first for the surgeon, cardiologist, and the patient, whether it's redo surgery, tavern, 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 saver, more procedures. But hemodynamic strategy is essential. And for us surgeons, we've known for decades now that the variability in our design and the leaflet preparation and preservation, et cetera, affects structural failure, need for reinnervation, survival, and patient prosthesis mismatch has been the enemy for us for decades. And now we talk about TAVR and SAVR. Is, the, are the, is, the, is there a need to enlarge the root? Is the valve fracturable? What about the leaflet dynamics and leaflet management? 45 years ago this year, PPM was described by a cardiologist who uh, proposed that maybe we're putting too small of valves in our patients and we would have consequences. And in fact, we have a lot of data in the surgical literature that some of the most impactful effects on failure and need for reoperation, here's a 12,500 perimount valves. Uh, the most significant influence on need to reintervention is high gradient at procedure and at follow-up. And it correlates very specifically with the degree of post-operative gradient. We even have a registry now with over 60,000 patients in it looking at PPM in surgery, surgical patients. Oops, sorry. And uh, there's an 8% increase in mortality with moderate and 32% with severe PPM in follow-up. Any degree of PPM affects survival and increased long-term readmission rates for heart failure. <laughs> and now moving into TAVR, our Australian colleagues looked at SAVR and TAVR and looked at normal hemodynamics, mildly, uh, moderately, and severely impaired, and found that in their, in their survey, about 25% of their patients had significant PPM. And this did affect their survival. And in fact, <clears throat> uh, patients with severe PPM had a serious five-year mortality rate. And in fact, a moderate or severe impaired valvular hemodynamics in five years was 45% and 57% in this population of 6,000 patients evaluated. And of course, Howie Herman's evaluation of the effect of mortality uh, for TAVR is pretty disappointing, I think, when we all saw these numbers that over th a third of our patients qualified for patient prosthesis mismatch in TAVR, and that had effect on mortality at one year. And this was predominantly in valve and valve influence and small valve sizes. A huge uh, meta-analysis, 23 studies looking at 90,000 patients who had TAVR, and you can see here 19,000 uh, versus 62,000 patients with PPM. The most significant influence on mortality was PPM and severe in nature. Well, we've been moving into some of our randomized trials. Here's from the SIRTAVI trial. If you look at surgical patients and TAVR patients with PPM or without PPM, at one year, an 8% difference in, in mortality. And now we're finally accumulating lots of data looking at the differences between the prostheses, the effects on size and annulus, and the effect on valve type. In fact, clearly small annulus uh, has a tr significant effect on durability in these patients. And also valve type. Balloon expandable and self expandable valves in the large meta analysis here showed inferior <coughs> uh, durability related to uh, compared to self expanding valves. And I think one of the most interesting papers last year presented at Jack by Mike Reardon was the correlation with SVD on mortality in surgery, TAVR, and also in the combined patients. <coughs> 
Well, looking over the last few years, I think it's been interesting that the self-expanding valves have performed better than surgery uh, in every trial that's been done and at every point along the follow-up all the way out to five years. And both self-expanding valve has performed better than balloon expandable valve now out to five years in choice and several other analyses. And earlier today, uh, Raj McCarp uh, uh, presented the five-year data looking at Portico versus commercially available valve. And it showed so, so similar hemodynamics to Evolute, which has shown the best hemodynamics we've seen so far in long-term follow-up in randomized trials going out to five years and better hemodynamics than Sapien 3 out to five years. And now that we have the, uh, the Navator valve, and albeit only one year, uh, the valve hemodynamics at one year are really spectacular and very similar to what we saw with first generation Portico. Much has been made on small gradients. Well, what's the difference? It's only three millimeters of difference. This is from, from the Sertabi uh, uh, trial. Although there's a small difference between TAVR and SAVR, if you look at the patients who have high mean gradients at follow-up or small EOAs, uh, they are uh, clearly in the surgical group versus the TAVR group. And looking at small annulus, 23 uh, sapien versus evolute 26, although the differences are only six millimeters uh, in small annuli, if you look at the percentage of those patients that have uh, small annulus at one year or with greater than 20 millimeters of mercury gradient, there's a five-fold increase in the, self, in the uh, balloon expandable group. So regarding surgical valve replacement durability, there's substantial evidence that the elevated Doppler gradients correlate with PPM leading to structural degeneration and mortality. It's not really much of a controversy. Similarly, there's a substantial and credible evidence elevated transcatheter AVR Doppler gradients correlate with PPM and structural deterioration and its consequences, survival. It's unclear why it's still controversial to me in terms of TAVR. But self-expanding valves seem to have better hemodynamics than balloon-expanding valves, which is likely will portend better SVD rates and survival. So do gradients matter? Of course they do. So the first cut is the deepest. Uh, we know it's a Classic hit, generational. Fontana and Bononi and now Marty probably know that that was Cat Stevens who wrote that song, but mm -hmm. a half a generation behind us, it was Rod Stewart, right, Francesco? That's who you know. And then, of course, Cheryl Crow, Danny, Dr. Patterson, Dr. DeMarco. That's probably what you think. But I would advocate this should be the anthem of the heart team. The first cut is the deepest. So don't trade established and proven benefits for theoretical events which have very low real rates of occurrence. Remember, the first cut truly is the deepest. Thank you. Director's cut. Like, uh, <laughs> you come, uh, coming from Hollywood uh, can only be... I can't say anything negative about Cat Stevens. So. <laughs> Which means basically it's my, it was my college hemodynamics. Huh? Yeah, but it's complicated um, because you know people used to say that as a surrogate for hemodynamics was whether or not it was intraannular or superannular. That's wrong. People used to say that as a surrogate for hemodynamics, if it's a short frame versus a long frame, that's also wrong. Um, so it's much more complicated. It's the frame length. It's the shape. It's the leaflet shape. It's a whole variety of things. So I don't think you can generalize so easy into genre subtypes. And then there's the, the issue, and I'm not quite sure about this. We'll know more with the SMART trial um, um, about echo hemodynamics under all circumstances. Remember, the Bernoulli equation was really validated in states of stenosis, not in states of normal flow. So when you're dealing with long tubes that have a lot of turbulence, it has a leveling effect on, on you know, ultimately looking at gradients and changes. So it's more complicated than I can begin to um, articulate, but it's just not so simple to put everything in you know, a, a corner or in a box. You've got to look at each device uh, individually. And I'll give you some examples. Presented at this meeting will be the Duravalve, uh, the DuraVR. So this is a mono leaflet design, which is a short frame balloon expandable device that has hemodynamics at least as good, probably better than the Evolute. Um, they've done now 19 patients, and we've done careful echoes, and, and I'm convinced. Right now, to me, the best hemodynamic valve that we've used is the Jenna valve. Short frame, self-expanding device, where we've seen in relatively small devices, valve areas of close to two and a half. 
So I just don't think you can generalize so easily, and you've got to look at each one of these devices individually. What's striking to me about Portico is that with an intraannular device and with a frame that has very open cells with good coronary access and with good deliverability, uh, you can have such good intraannular gradients. Um, so I think that's impressive, and I think that that may become important as we make comparisons over the long term. And the data from, uh, from the Portico RCT, I mean, the, the comparison with uh, the one from Rush, they're very really co convincing. What do you want to say? But I think that's true, Mark, but we need to separate the idea of design. Which yeah, you're right. The next, the next perfect hemodynamic valve may be something that's blue and expandable. It could be something we haven't considered. But fundamentally, with gradients, uh, and every study we've ever done, and even now with TAVR, uh, elevated gradients are not good. And, yeah, They're we, not good. And, um, no. you know, we can go on about fresh recovery and all kinds of measurement and, measurement and measurement at rest versus activity or versus in the office versus on the table. But at the end of the day, what we want is the lowest gradient possible, and that seems to be consistent in giving us a longer lasting valve, whether it be surgical or TAVR, those four. And if you don't have PPM, survival is benefit too, right? Agree. Completely okay. agree. Okay, good. I was so worried. I just want to me. say something about Greg. You can sit down. You know, Greg is always ahead of us. <laughs> Tell you why. Marty, yesterday was Innovators Day. And we've been discussing uh, if you have money. Uh, I think um, some of you were in the, in the audience. We were discussing where to put your money in the future between aortic, mitral, and tricuspid. And the consensus was invest in a pizzeria. He did it. <laughs> <laughs> he did it. <laughs> invest in an Italian restaurant in New York City. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, but uh, remember that the five years follow-up to the Portico, Portico one was presented uh, uh, hour ago. Yes, exactly. So the SBD at five years was zero. Zero, absolutely. That is a single arm. The, the Portico one is a, is a registry. That has been also... Uh, just before this session, the RCT from Rajmakar also showing a, 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 a great difference in, in uh, valve areas and ingredients uh, in, uh, in uh, the portico compared to other commercial uh, valves available. So, very interesting data. Obviously, need, they need to be assessed a bit more carefully, but, uh, you know, be careful. Exactly. <laughs> Being careful, you know. <laughs> The best pizza is a quattro stagioni. You put a bit of everything, so everybody is happy. Now, let's go with the next uh, uh, presentation. Yes, this is you. It's exactly you, Federico De Marco, who is going to speak about something which is off label. I need to say it again. I don't know why, because you didn't find the third, the third leaflet. So let's just jump directly into the case. It's a 71 years old female, hypertensive with dyslipidemia. Uh, her past uh, medical history uh, has uh, um, a known by caspid aortic valve under uh, periodic clinical and echo follow-up. In uh, 2020, she has had an ischemic stroke, which was treated with uh, thrombolytic therapy. And this was probably due to a paroxysmal AF, which was diagnosed through an ILR, uh, ILR after this episode, and after which she obviously started uh, uh, NOAC therapy. Uh, this is her echo. There is severe aortic stenosis with 42 uh, mean gradient. We had a discussion, and because of the uh, quite recent stroke, uh, uh, the patient was deemed at uh, uh, high risk for surgery. She was above, just above 70, and so the heart team uh, discussion addressed the patient for TAVI. This is her CT uh, anatomy. Uh, you see the calcifications are uh, not extreme, but it's definitely a two leaflet valve. We have one large coronary leaflet and one uh, minor non-coronary leaflets with most of the calcification uh, sitting on the free margin of the leaflet. We also have some dense calcium and the uh, perimeter derived diameter is 23.1, uh, which is just uh, at the border between a, a 25 and a 27 uh, millimeter valve. The area is 413 square millimeter and the eccentricity is not uh, uh, super severe with a minor axis of 21 and a larger axis just above 25 millimeter. 
Uh, we decided to treat this patient with a 25 millimeter Navitor valve. Uh, we do not like the strategy of excessive oversizing in bicuspid, and this is mutuated uh, by uh, the, the use of different uh, platforms. So we consisted uh, consistently with our strategy, we decided to use a 25 millimeter valve. Uh, this is the baseline angiogram. Uh, the, mm, you see some classification at the level of the uh, aortic valve. Uh, the, uh, we did a pre-dilatation with a 23 millimeter semi-compliant balloon, obviously looking uh, perpendicular to the uh, opening, so uh, in order to see the uh, calcification displacement uh, when the balloon was inflated. Then we advanced the Navitor uh, 25 millimeter device, uh, which was implanted uh, really with a super slow uh, release in order for the device to find its place and to avoid, you know, uh, excessive movement of the device. Um, after a while, we started some controlled pacing, just above 100 uh, BPM. Uh, the device probably, you know, was ending up a little bit too slow, too, too, too low, sorry, so we pushed a little bit on the guide wire uh, in order to uh, optimize uh, the positioning. Here, obviously, the, the device appears quite low uh, towards the uh, left sinus, but that's probably also due to the fact that this is by cuspid valve and the calcifications are, are quite higher. Anyway, this is the final position, just a couple of millimeters below uh, the virtual bezel ring. Uh, we quite like this final position and after waiting for a couple of minutes for the uh, nitino to, to uh, heat properly and for the device to uh, sit in the anatomy, we went uh, to the final release of the three uh, retaining tabs from the uh, device. This is the final angiographic outcome, which is really good. And also in a uh, sort of a perpendicular view, we do not see uh, any uh, uh, constraint of the valve, any asymmetry of expansion so we decided not to uh, post-dilate uh, the uh, patient. Uh, this is the follow-up echo, uh, surface echo, obviously, with uh, hardly any uh, visible PV leak, That's, uh, uh, and the gradient also was single digit uh, and uh, the outcome uh, particularly good. I have just some discussion points. We decided to use uh, the uh, Navitor device in a young patient. Uh, Tavi was favored, obviously, because of the uh, uh, recent stroke. And this is a type 0 bicuspid, which, again, is off-label. But I think that uh, the uh, Navitor device has really an excellent conformability and also uh, has very good sealing, also in eccentric anatomy. Job. Uh, the, the first question is, uh, I, give you, I, I want to ask you first question. Would you do this with uh, Portico? Probably not. Navidor is really an advantage here. It's been a step forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think the addition you know, of a nice ceiling cuff, which is really effective in preventing PVR, has, has kind of you know, you know, paved the way towards dealing more challenging anatomies with this platform. It's, to be honest, I'm also a pretty, uh, I use uh, the, the platform often, and I start now to, start to think about this platform into bicuspid, is, is, you know, we have been using different platforms in the past, uh, it's opening a new, a, new, a new chapter here, it's uh, still a, a debatable, uh, uh, debated uh, arena, what is the best uh, cover platform for uh, bicuspid, I know that uh, Marty, you are very sensible in this topic, correct? There are many different. No, I think that people, you know, rush to do bicuspids, and I don't know that that's um, the right thing. Um, <clears throat> surgery is still pretty good in some of these patients, especially if they have aortopathy or if they have, you know, really extreme leaflet calcification with a calcified raphe. So if, if you're going to start, I think type zeros are a good place to start. And this was fairly symmetric. And the calcification at the annular level was not that great without that much, with almost nothing extending into the outflow tract. Um, and even the calcification of the leaflets was not that great. So I think this is a really good one to start with. And you got a great result. So, you, you know, I applaud you. So I think it's a well-selected um, bicuspid and a good case to start with, yeah. Like Aspid, uh, I, I just want to remind you, probably 2003, Milano, our first case together. 
That's right. Uh, I'd like to remind you that the first case ever done in 2002 by Alain Cribier into, was also a bicuspid. <coughs> so, so, yes. So you see, that, that is interesting because we are still, you know, it's off label, but really we, we, we didn't care too much at the beginning. Yeah. I think it's uh, one point for versatility again. I mean, uh, it becomes even more versatile, this platform. About the, the the any comment? Are you surprised by seeing by Caspid in this? Uh, I mean, why would it not work? Because this is a, a easier by Caspid version than a typical type one that has a nasty rafe and all this kind of stuff. But I think you brought out a very important point that if you are in between sizes, or even if you were, would be in a full twenty-seven, still. We don't know whether or not what people sometimes uh, refer to as downsizing, which I would say it's a true sizing because you size the valve to the anatomy in the bicuspid, especially type zero. The super annular sizing concepts, lots of stuff to start discussing about, and I think there's not enough ex expertise yet with the Navito mm -hmm. platform because it's technically not allowed, right? So that we cannot really start the discussion on the scientific ground, but with other platforms, it's the usual discussion that would start right now, right away. Now, how do you do the sizing? any place for balloon uh, sizing and this kind of stuff. I agree with you. I mean, there is a, a lot of uh, gray in bicuspids. You can have some extreme levels of classifications, which we see more in bicuspid anatomies as compared probably to tricuspid. And again, this was not a, a super, uh, not a challenging case in terms of, of uh, classification, but still you can see some unexpected behavior of the calcium in bicuspids. Thank you very much. We need to move forward. We are uh, now, I think it is an you know, escalation of uh, complexity. This is a, called Russian dolls. I can only tell you what is about it. So the, the responsibility of the title is of Francesco anyway, so <laughs> obviously. <laughs> So this is a case, this is my case, <coughs> the, my conflict of interest this is 80 years old male with uh, the, the usual uh, comorbidities. Uh, he was treating uh, uh, just uh, some uh, month before for an uh, uh, PCI, a uh, multi, multiversal PCI. He was operated in 2004 with a, with a mental procedure with a, a perimount 23 <coughs> due to severe aortic regurgitation and uh, ascending aortic aneurysm. This is the this is the valve you know is a 23 uh, paramount uh, inner diameter through ID is a 21. Uh, in, uh, in at the end of the year he had the worsening of shortness and I was uh, hospitalized. Uh, there is uh, this is the echocardiographic assessment. There is a severe prosthetic degeneration with mean gradient 55 millimeters mercury and severe regurgitation. So the indication was uh, valve in valve. Uh, this is the CT. Pre procedural evaluation, you can see that uh, the, the, the annulus size is compatible with the valve size, uh, the prosthesis size. The VTC is uh, short, but the eight of the coronary arteries are quite uh, high, so no, no problem uh, about uh, the, 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 the coronary occlusion because 20 millimeters uh, in uh, the eight of the both coronary. This is the this is the angel, uh, severe uh, regurgitation. Uh, following uh, our experience, uh, started in the 2015, uh, we, we proceeded with the valve and valve procedure with portico, 23 millimeters. Uh, because we have, the, despite the fact that this is a, a, a bailout procedure, maybe we have the, a, a large experience on that. So uh, we started with the, the procedure. This is uh, the, the initial position. And unfortunately, this is the final position. The, the valve slided the, uh, down a little bit, but now we have the crown uh, deeper. So is what, uh, what uh, is, uh, we expect as a result, but uh, we are, the pressure is not so bad. Uh, the, uh, the echo shows uh, mild regurgitation, so at the beginning we have set this uh, with, uh, with uh, this, uh, this result and we decide to follow up the patient. 
but uh, the follow up was uh, not so nice. You had the other CRD implantation, that they are again uh, uh, acute uh, admission for uh, pulmonary edema, and so we have to review the patient. This is the this is the angel you will see. Uh, probably the the valve slides down a little bit more because now we have a one crown and a half in the ventricle. The the regurgitation is important. Uh, the patient didn't uh, tolerate it, so uh, we proceeded with valve in valve. We we did uh, uh, we had we snare to avoid to push down again the valve go inside and this time we decided to use Navitor which was available no problem to cross the valve and we proceed uh, pay attention with the eight to the second implantation you can see this is a release in three cusp view and cusp overlap view this is the final result with very good pressure this time and we check the coronary excess with uh, the spell fat we have two uh, two valve uh, uh, we have uh, no problem to to go deep in uh, in uh, coronary artery due to the the large stem cells it is very important so the take home message is uh, the problem in the valve in valve procedure is uh, gradient and coronary excess and risk of coronary occlusion i think when the Porting and Navitor now are very interesting um, valve for uh, for valve in valve procedure because of the light metal structure. It's now non flared valve, the good uh, that uh, leads to have a very good hemodynamics and uh, even in small annulus, uh, large than cell uh, give us an uh, easy coronary access with the wide possibility of tabby and tabby procedure. And probably Navitor with higher radial force compared to Portico is, uh, we, we may, may work even better. Thank you so much. Thank you, Francesco. Unfortunately, we are almost, we are over time already, but we have time for uh, some uh, some discussion. I think it's a it's a proof of concept, correct? So it was not really a degenerated this, uh, the, the disease, the degenerative disease, but it's a proof of concept that you can do multiple tower in tower and uh, and. Uh, Think about the future when we talk to our patients. What do you think, uh, Jorg? To you, maybe, because now. Yeah, so uh, first of all, I have to say it. The first valve, the surgical one, also it was only a 23, which is rather on a small side for a male, lasted 17 years. So it's something that is very reassuring that it can be coming back to the concept the first cut is the deepest. It's a good platform to put in any transcatheter valve later on. It's much easier than doing a tava and tava. Not saying it's not possible, but obviously less. Less hassle. And of the valve and valve and tava and tava that you had here, yes, of course, it is proving that you can put several layers. But here, we have to be fair. The first one slipped in the ventricle, which also kind of the risk plane, the neoskirt, also went down, right? So we didn't have two true tava and tava devices. So I'm not saying that it wouldn't work with the Navitor because it's less stuff in front of the coronary. So the neoskirt is lower than in some competitor valves. But here, we have to be fair. It also, there was no real risk of coronary obstruction. Well, anyway, there's a bent up procedure, so the, the, the coronary implant was mm -hmm. very high. So I, I don't think that uh, some millimeters higher, in higher position will change anyway. The, the, but it's uh, the, the, to show that the access, uh, even with the two frame cells, is very easy. Very important. There are no surgeons in the room. I always say, when you do bent up, put the coronary eyes. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I always say important. that in surgical yeah. means. You should go and tell your surgeons. So but not only for the cardiologist, also that you don't get a kink, right? From yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, no, it was I would it. like to summarize that yes. in this situation, the, the height of the skirt matters. So, <laughs> for the future intervention. So since we are in the summaries, Marty, uh, you want to summarize? No. Uh, so, I mean, <laughs> we, we have been, to, I summarize sh just time. shortly what we have said, and you, you, I give you the last word. <laughs> I think uh, hemodynamics, first cut, blah, 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 okay? Hemodynamics, we are convinced, we have a good platform for hemodynamics. Uh, we have been uh, seeing that really versatility in different uh, complex anatomies, including even the uh, bicuspid valve. We have been now 
testing the concept of revalability, whatever, and coordinate access. So overall, we are in a good direction. So what do you think, Martin? No, I'm thrilled. I, you know, I think having new TAVR platforms are going to make a difference. So I think that uh, we're delighted to see that Portico Navitor is going to be you know, in the United States with an expanded indication that would allow us to be able to treat more patients. We still have more work to do, but I think it's a great uh, entry into the portfolio of devices we have. It's got some fairly unique characteristics and a lot of attributes, and I think that, that um, the structuralists are going to really take advantage of those things. Um, I would argue that the more data you accumulate, the better because the predicate devices have a lot of data, and seeing the five-year data for me makes me feel more comfortable, so that's important. I would like to see not just a single case, but I think you should be doing registries with carefully selected bicuspids, and you should be doing valve and valve, and you should be trying to extend the indications in such a way that you can better advise the structuralist based upon experience and evidence rather than based upon anecdote. So I think that's one of the things that I would strongly encourage. But this is a great start, and uh, I learned a lot in this um, um, one hour, and uh, we did a good job together to define the ideal TAVI platform. Thank you so much, and thank you, everybody. Thanks, Abbott.